we have to focus today. And the theme I want us to get is how holy he is. And if you, by the end of this you feel, boy, I'm inadequate to stand in his presence, then I answer, yes, you are. But we'll talk about how we still can stand in his presence. And not only just stand in there, but stand in there confidently. But just kind of a disclaimer, the first half of this sermon is probably going to be one of the more uncomfortable ones that I preach. Because we cannot talk about God's holiness without talking about our unholiness and our unworthiness. And so there's going to be a lot of that. But stick with me, because what God did for us and the comfort that he gives us to stand in his presence well, obviously, it's through Christ. But the reason I chose to focus on this holiness of God is because all too often, the thing that gets all the attention is the love of God. And yes, we do serve a God of love, but oftentimes we, we forget that we also serve a holy God. You know, one of the common phrases today is, but God loves me. He's not going to, you know, loving God doesn't send people to hell. But we forget his holiness. I think Charles Spurgeon said it best. He said, when we preach of the love of God, there is a danger of forgetting that the Bible reveals not first the love of God, but the intense, blazing holiness of God with his love at the center of his holiness. And I like that phrase, love at the center of his holiness, because it is his love at the center of his holiness. His holiness means that he has a standard, and if anyone falls short of that standard, then it's hell. And in his love, he sent his son, but he sent his son because of his holiness. And so we have to have both. Yes, we serve a loving God, but we serve a holy God as well. And this holy God demands something from you and I. In fact, he doesn't so much demand it as he requires it. As it says in Leviticus 19, verse 20, or I'm sorry, verse 2, Leviticus 19, verse 2. It says, give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. So the command is for us, for personal holiness. Why? Because God says, I am holy. And so let's, let's have a definition of holiness. What is holiness? A real simple definition, one I used when I taught children, is this. Holiness means cannot sin, cannot stand sin, and cannot be around sin. That's kind of all-encompassing. God is holy, which means he cannot sin. It is impossible for God to sin. He cannot stand sin either. It's what he hates. If you want to know something God hates, it is sin, because it is totally contrary to his nature. It's an abomination in his sight. And because of that, the third one, he cannot be around sin. And so therefore, if we are to be God's people, if we want God's presence in our lives, then verse, chapter 19, verse 2, you must be holy because I am holy. You know, God is saying, if you want me to be your God, if we're going to have a relationship, then you have to be holy. Because God cannot be around sin. All too often, though, holiness is not something we focus on in today's world. All too often, holiness is often something we are more than happy to sacrifice. Oftentimes, we sacrifice holiness for personal pleasure. You know, it makes me feel good. I want to do it. We sacrifice holiness for happiness, but it makes me happy. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard somebody kind of justify sin by saying, God wants me to be happy. It makes me happy. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to be joyful because he does, but happiness is a fleeting emotion. And God's priority is never on our happiness. It is on our holiness. Because happiness is temporary, but holiness gives us eternal life. Or we sacrifice holiness for convenience. Because I promise you, holiness is always the harder route to take. And it's much more convenient not to worry about holiness. Or finally, we sacrifice holiness because we have a lack of understanding of God's mercy. So what do I mean there? Well, God's mercy is not to allow us to continue our sinful life. You know, so many people, oh, God forgave me. It doesn't matter. I can keep living this way. That's a lack of understanding of God's mercy. God did not give us his mercy to allow us to continue in the sinful life. In fact, he gave us his mercy so that we could 
Put to death the sinful life and have a new life in him. Amen. So we must be holy. One of the greatest attacks to holiness, especially the one that this world gives us today, is the belief that here and now is all there is. And you'll hear that a lot, especially in movies or you know, from speakers. You know, This is your life. Live it to the fullest. How many times have you heard that? You only live once. No regrets. Because, again, the world's focus is on here and now. The world's focus is not on eternity. The world's message is you have one life. You better live it the way you want to live it. And so this is where we come up with the idea of, well, God's just being too restrictive. God's just being too restrictive. My life, you know, I want to live it the way I want. So that's what the world says. But the truth of the scriptures, the truth of the gospel message is that this life is not all we have. In fact, the truth of the scripture is that what we do in this life matters into eternity. How we live here matters. Because we all must stand before Christ. And so a perfect test of holiness is by imagining Jesus standing here with us. Now understand the truth of the scriptures is that Jesus is always here with us through the Holy Spirit. But oftentimes we lose the power of his presence because we can't see him. You know, because we say the Holy Spirit lives in us, but it's hard for us to imagine him actually being here with us. So I promise you, Jesus is here with you, but you can't see him. But just uh, John MacArthur did this. Imagine if he was here. John MacArthur said, if Jesus was here, would you be ashamed to show him what you're reading? Would you want him to read what you're reading? Would you be ashamed if Jesus sat down and let's say, hey, let's watch one of your favorite movies. What's that? And you showed him what you've been watching. Would you be ashamed to introduce Jesus to your friends? You know, if Jesus said, hey, you're going out with your friends. Can I go with you? Would you do the same things? Would you go to the same places? Would you talk the way you did if he was here? The Bible makes it very clear that not only is not this life not it, but there will come a day where we will physically see Jesus in front of us. Not just, you know, Jesus is here with us and not see him, but we will physically see him. We can see the nails pierced hands, the spear pierced side. And he says that we have to talk. We have to give an account of our lives. It says in, in Hebrews 9, verse 27, about this, the, the judgment of God. Hebrews 9, verse 27. And it says, and just as each person is destined to die once. So in a sense, the world is right. This life is all we have. We have one death. And once we die, that, that ends our earthly journey. There's no do-over. There's no second chance. There's no reincarnation. So this life is all we have. And additionally, the, the finality of death is not just that it ends our life here and now, but it seals our fate for the afterlife. Because once we die, there's no more second chance of redemption. That happens here and now. And so it says, and it's destined for each person to die once, and then after that comes judgment. So we die, and then after that death comes judgment. Definitely not one of the more comfortable words we read in Scripture. In fact, judgment is probably the words that, that we, lead, we try to stay away from the most because it's a, it's a scary, it's a nerve-wracking thing. This idea of standing before God and having to be judged... And there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a teaching that says, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I don't have to be judged before God. I, I, you know, that, that's already taken care of. But in our key scripture for today, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, it says, and this is Paul speaking to the church. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church at, at Corinth. It says, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. And we will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we've done in this earthly body. And so what we do here and now matters. What we do here and now, we have to give an account before the Lord. Standing in the presence of a holy God. And so my question again is, are you prepared to stand before God? Are you prepared to be judged by this holy God? Before you answer, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be judged on. What would we have to face when we stand before God. 
There's a lot that the Bible talks about as far as judgment. I think the two clearest places are in Matthew 12, the verses 36 to 37, and also in Ecclesiastes 12, 4. But let's go to Matthew first. Matthew 12, verses 36 to 37. Standing before God. And the beginning in verse 36, the words of Jesus. He says, I tell you this. You must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say here will either acquit you or condemn you. So the first requirement, the first standard is words, the words we speak. Now notice the Bible doesn't just say evil words, it just says idle words. If you want a definition of an idle word, it's any word that doesn't bring glory to Christ. That would be considered an idle word. Maybe it's not necessarily evil, but if it's not bringing glory to Christ, it's considered idle. So it says you'll have to give an account for that. Not to mention, what about the evil words? And if you want to know, I promise you, cuss words are considered evil words. Not just idle words, they are evil words. And if you're saying, well, I struggle with that, the Bible says, yeah, it's one of the hardest things to struggle with. In fact, the Bible says the tongue is the most wild of all creatures. Who can tame it? Idle words. So are you prepared to give God an account of your speech? And the excuse, I'm sorry, I was angry, does not hold up to God's glorious standard. Or it slipped out, does not hold up to God's glorious standard. Because that's how holy he is. And so he demands holiness from us. Additionally, in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14... It gets to our actions. So not only our words, but our actions. And it says, God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. So now not only do we have words, but we have actions. The actions we do, whether good or bad. And it says even the secret things. Maybe it's things that nobody else knows about. Maybe it's something you've con successfully concealed. God still knows. You can't hide it from God. So not only do we stand before a holy God, but we stand before a God who's all-knowing, who knows our deepest, darkest secrets. How are any of us to survive? Now, even after presenting this, there are still some, and I've heard them tell me before, well, I'm still good enough. I've done good enough. Uh, in fact, uh, my, my friend, an uh, unbelieving friend of mine, the same one I always usually talk about because we do spend some time together, but he said, you know, if my good outweighs my bad, then I'm doing all right. I can, I'll be fine. I, I'm good enough. Or oftentimes, I'm better than so-and-so. And Yeah, if you want to compare yourself to others, but God doesn't do that. The truth of Scripture is that none could survive. In Romans 3, verse 23, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. That is a perfect definition. You want a definition of sin? That's it. Falling short of God's glorious standard. The Greek word for sin in its literal translation means missing the mark. And the context it's often used in is in like shooting a target. You know, imagine shooting a bullseye. You know, you aim for the bullseye, the smallest part on the target. Anything short of the bullseye is considered missing the mark which is considered sin. Of course, the bullseye is the smallest and hardest to hit part. There's going to be a lot of missing the mark. That's why the Bible says everyone has sinned. We all fall short. Because when we stack our lives up to God's glorious standard, I promise none of the good we do is good enough. I mean, we have to stand before a God like that. Not only is, is this a God who can't sin, can't be around sin, in Habakkuk 1.13 it says, but you are so pure you can't stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? So now we have an additional standard. God can't even stand the sight of sin. He can't even look upon it. How are we to survive? How are we to stand in his presence and anyone say, I am clean, I am worthy? Because the truth is, none are clean, none are worthy. 
Again, the same friend of mine brought up this conversation, and we, I was recently spending a, a, a weekend with him. Just uh, He lives kind of far away, so we drive down and usually spend a night or two with each other because we don't see each other a lot. But he had said, uh, we were talking about salvation. He likes to talk about God because he grew up Christian, and now he says he got more educated and doesn't need that anymore. Um, so, and we were talking, and he was talking about this, this idea of God's holiness, this idea of God's standard. And he said, so God punishes all sin. I said, yes. He said, well, you know, the bad sins, of course, murder and everything. I said, yes. And he's like, you know, what about the little sins of telling a white lie or thinking bad thoughts? So well, that's still sin, too. And so he said, how can a God punish that? He said, how would a God condemn that? So well, he's holy. And he said, it sounds like an impossible standard. I said, it is. It is an impossible standard. And then, and then he said, well, how can anyone meet that standard? I said, no one can. Our sin causes a divide between us and God that we cannot cross. And if we tried to stack up our good deeds to get across, they wouldn't even reach halfway across. There is a great chasm between us and God because of our sins. And it's not God condemning us, it's us condemning ourselves because we're the ones that committed the sin. And so what is God to do? Well, God had a solution. And it first started with the nation of Israel. The Old Testament serves many, many uses. One of the best is to show of the holiness of God. And so the nation of Israel were God's chosen people. God chose to dwell among them, to reveal himself to them, so that they could reveal him to the rest of the world. But in Deuteronomy 23, verse 14, God tells them that his, that his presence with them is not an unconditional presence. He says, if you want me to be a part of you, then you have to do something. You have to make some changes. As it says in 23, verse 14, it says, this camp must be holy, for the Lord your God moves around you in your camp to protect you and to defeat your enemies, and he must not see any shameful thing among you, or he will turn away from you. So there's, there's the truth. There's the hard truth. It says, if you want my presence with you, you must get rid of all shameful things, because if I see them, I'll leave you. And of course, if you read the Old Testament, you know the nation of Israel, they were somewhat of connoisseurs of sin, especially when it, Moses wasn't around. And it's easy for us to look at them and say, well, how terrible of them, but don't you and I do the same thing? I mean, if we were being honest with ourselves, the nation of Israel is no worse than you and I act sometimes. And so God knew that. God knew the nation of Israel. They, he knew that they were sinful people who could not meet his standard. And so he tells Moses in Exodus 33, beginning in verse 3, to go on without him. This is when they're in the wilderness and God's revealed himself to them. And then he tells Moses, now continue on without me. Because God's given them this great standard. And in Exodus 33, verse 3, he says, Go up to the land that flows with milk and honey, but I will not travel among you. For you are a stubborn and rebellious people. Or other translations say a stiff-necked people. And it says, if I were to travel with you for even a moment, I would destroy you. So he says, I, you can't do it. He says, there's no way you can meet my standard. He says, so you go on. I'll stay here. I can't be among you. It's too great. But what I love best about Exodus 33 is Moses' response in verse 15. It says that Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. And I love that because they're in the wilderness right now. It's not really a great place to be. The place that they were sent to go, the land flowing with milk and honey, that's one of the most fertile places on earth. I mean, it's fought for today because of how great it is in resources. But Moses says, if you don't go with us, we'd rather remain here. Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, you keep us here where you are because we want to be with you. And so is that your heart? Would you rather remain with God? in his presence. Do you love God more than your sinful life? Because you can't have both. You can't have your sinful life and God's presence. And so would you be like Moses and say, Lord, no, I want to get rid of this. I want you to stay with me. Or do you love your sin more? 
Of course, you know the story. God relented and the people of Israel continued on with God's presence. But there was a condition to that presence again. Because in verse 20 of Exodus 33, it says, But you cannot look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. So there was still a separation. He says, I'll be your God. I will go personally with you, but you can't look upon me. Because if we were to see God in our sinful self, we would melt. His glory, his presence would destroy us. So he says, out of love, he says, I can't, you can't look at me. So then, of course, if you know what, what they did is they, they set up the tabernacle and later the temple, and God's presence remained on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat right above it. And they put the mercy seat in what is known as the Holy of Holies or the most holy place. And then they put a big curtain up, dividing the holy place from the most holy place. And this was no ordinary curtain. You know, we see, you know, window curtains or veils. This was not nothing like that. This veil, as it's called, was 30 feet tall, 60 feet long, and four inches thick to separate God's presence from the rest. And it had to be that thick because if even a ray of God's presence got out of the holy place and somebody saw that, his holiness is so powerful it would destroy them. And so here's the relationship that the people of Israel have. None of them can talk personally to God. The high priest can go in once a year to God's presence. But for you and I, the common people, we would have no chance of speaking to the God himself because he's too holy. The best we could do is pray and tell the priest our prayers and the priest take it to God and then hope he answers. And even the high priest, as I said, could only go in once a year. They could only see God personally once a year. As it says in Leviticus 2 verse, or 16 verses 2 and 3, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. For the ark of the covering, the place of atonement is there, and I myself am present in the clouds above the atonement covering. So he says, My presence is so powerful. You can go in once a year. And then if you read, especially in Leviticus, there's a whole process to get you ready for God's presence. It'd probably take all morning. You have to bathe, you have to anoint yourself, you have to wrap yourself. And if the high priest did one thing wrong when he stepped in God's presence, it would kill him. So I'm assuming the high priest wasn't like, oh yes, I get to go in God's presence. He's probably terrified. He said, oh, do everything right. I better do everything right because if I stand in his presence and I'm not right, I will be killed. And that was the relationship that, he, that they had with God. Hopelessly separated. You know, my friend, when talking about the holiness of God, he said, who could meet this standard? The answer is none of us. How could we stand before a God like this? How could we stand before a God who is so against sin that he can't even look upon it. So are you prepared to meet a God like this? Or is it terrifying? Is the idea terrifying? Now there's always going to be a little bit of fear because he's God, he's holy. There's always going to be a feeling of inadequacy because we are inadequate. And I think one of the most honest places in scripture that talk about the presence of God and talk about the judgment of God in an honest sense is in Revelation 6. Revelation 6, beginning in verse 12. And now the people's reaction here, if we're being honest, is a very honest reaction to God's judgment. Now this is in the midst of the tribulation. As, God, as Christ breaks the sixth seal, it kind of jumps ahead to what the end of the tribulation would look like when God brings his judgment. And it says, as I watched, the lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as a black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. The sky rolled up like a scroll, and all the mountains and islands moved from their place. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, the every slave and free person, all hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountain. And they cried to the rocks of the mountain, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the great wrath of the Lamb. 
God's presence so powerful. They're like, hide us. We can't deal with it. We can't do it. And then they ask one of my favorite questions. For the great day of wrath has come, and who is able to survive? This conversation, as it, as it continued with my friend, he asked this. He said, if God has such an impossible standard, and I, I loved it. I kind of chuckled when he said it because it was almost like God put him right into my trap, as I call it. Because he goes, if God has such an impossible standard, he goes, how can anyone be saved? I said, oh, I know the answer to that one. He said, that's the gospel message. The, the, the answer is, who is able to survive? And we can look around and say, none of us. None of us are worthy. None of us could match, measure up. And God looks around and says the exact same thing. He says, none are worthy. Knowing that, God said, I'll do something about it. God said, if they were to go off on life on their own, they would be destroyed in my presence. He said, I need something to satisfy my wrath, satisfy my holiness, so that I could share my life with these people I love. And he provided that something by giving us Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came as a perfect substitute for you and I. Satisfying the perfect holiness of God and the perfect wrath of God. As it says in Romans 4, beginning in verse 25. It says, For God presented Christ as a sacrifice for sins. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice showed that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. So those under the old covenant. It says, For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just and declares that sinners are right in his sight by Jesus. Sinners are right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. That is amazing. This holy God, this God who cannot even look at sin, this God who must punish sin, says that when we come before him under the banner of Christ, we are made right in his sight. It says that when we accept Jesus as Lord, when we stand before him, he says, I declare you clean. I declare you holy. Not because we deserve it, not because we are holy, but because Christ took our punishment. And therefore, instead of standing before him with all of our sins, we stand before him. And we hold, it, we hold out something that says, paid in full through Jesus Christ. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says that for God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Other translations, uh, no, most notably the King James said it made right with God through Christ as we can be made the righteousness of God. I love that word righteousness. It's often translated to just living right or being right. But the, the word righteousness in a very literal sense means giving us right standing with God. And so it means that when we accept Christ who's never sinned, then we are made righteous with God. We have right standing with God. It means that we can now not fear the presence of God, but we can approach boldly the throne of God. And one of my favorite parts about the crucifixion of Jesus is what happened to that big veil when he died. In Matthew 27, beginning in verse 50, this big veil that had for so long separated the presence of God from the presence of man. In Matthew 27, verse 50, it says, Then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit. And the moment he died, at that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split apart, and the tombs opened. And the bodies of many godly women who had, men and women who had died were raised from the dead. But that old curtain that had stood in the way for so long said it was torn in two. This big, thick curtain that forever separated God's presence from man. Man. 
Notice it says it wasn't torn from the bottom to the top if, as if man were tearing it. It was torn from the top down. God took his own two hands and split it apart because he said through Christ now no longer would we be separated from his presence. Now no longer would there be a gap between us and him, but it is bridged through Christ. No longer would we have to go through a high priest because we have a high priest. And we could each approach God personally now, talking to him through Christ. And we can stand before God and not have to fear. We can stand before God and he can claim us as clean and holy through Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, when I asked is if anyone's ready to stand in the presence of God, if you have Christ, your answer could be yes. There could be no fear about it. Because once you have Christ, when you stand before God, he's not going to say, hey, I'm sorry, you're not good enough. You're going to hell. He can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He can call you forward and say, you have come home. There is no more judgment of heaven or hell for you and I because that has been decided by Christ on the cross. As it says in John 5, verse 24. John 5, verse 24. It says, I tell you the truth that those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And so then, then we, we ask the question, well, what does Paul mean when it says we still must stand before Christ and be judged? Well, here's the wonderful news. And Abby, I heard you say it earlier about having to, having to say about, you know, all the car crashes, or, or not car crashes, but all the car, car anger. The truth is their sins are washed away. Not a single sin will be brought up at our judgment seat before Christ. Not a single sin. Because it's been covered by Jesus. And as we've talked, if Jesus' blood covers it, it's completely forgotten. But our judgment seat before Christ is called the Bema seat, B-E-M-A. It means reward. It's not, you won't find that in Scripture. It's just what, what theologians had, have termed it over the years. Because the only thing that we get at our judgment is rewards. We are judged not for sin, but we are judged for God says, hey, give an account of your life. What have you done for me? Because he loves us so much, he says, not only will I give you eternal life, but let me reward you for all your hard work. As if eternal life wasn't good enough. He says, but I'll give you additional rewards. And so the worst thing that could happen at this judgment seat, I'm thinking specifically of, of somebody who just converts right before they die, is yeah, they don't have any works to give Christ because they converted right before they die. But, the, but they still get heaven they're not given any different of a status. They still get to go into glory forever. Our judgment seat before God should not be one that should be feared. In fact, it should be one we could run towards because he's ready to reward us. Our sins are washed away and we are declared right through Christ. And Christ says, I love you so much. Let me give you rewards for all that you've done. And so that should motivate us to work for the Lord. Because after all Christ has done for us, shouldn't we want to bring a trove of stuff back to give back to him? But we do not have to fear the presence of God because we have Christ. Christ took our judgment so that you and I could be made right in the sight of God. And so yes, none of us can face God on our own and live. But when we face him with Christ, he says, you are clean, you are holy. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. If God says nothing else to me in heaven but that, I will be happy for eternity. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, in your holiness, it is impossible to, see, to not see our faults. Lord, in your glorious standard, it is impossible for any of us to think we could be made right with you. There is nothing that we can do that would pay for our sins. And so you said, I'll pay it for you. Lord, we thank you for sending Christ, who died that we could be made right, who died so that we could have a relationship with you. And so, Lord, let us live our life living for Christ. There are those in our very, our very circles, Lord, that need to hear of Jesus because they are going to face you alone. That is something that they would not survive. Lord, we thank you for Christ.
And we thank you for his sacrifice. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just again, uh, the, the altar is always open. If you've got something that you need to deal with God with, this altar is for you. Uh, come forward if you want prayer by yourself. If you would like me to pray with you, again, I just ask that you hold your hand up or, or get my attention and, and we'll pray with you. But the altar is open. And let us now sing our, our closing hymn, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Amen. Amen.